Okay, so here's what we found, okay? Archimedes' principle is a clever realization that the amount of upward support force you get from a fluid, which we call buoyant force, well, that must be exactly equal to the water weight that you've displaced. So this is the weight of fluid displaced. And the reasoning for this is that water supports itself. If you take a look at any given chunk of water, that water is not falling down, it's staying put. What's holding it in place? The water around it. So if we take, for instance, a body of water, we take a look at a given chunk of water in it, it has weight, mass times g, and yet it's not falling down, why not? The water around it holds it up. And so water supports itself, but we can imagine snatching out this water and putting something, an object in its place, like this, of course the surrounding water doesn't know any different. So the surrounding water still does exactly the same job. So now, the amount of force you're getting upward, called the buoyant force, is equal to the weight of fluid that you've displaced with now some other thing, some other object. So let me draw a couple objects here. And I'll try to draw them all the same size. And if the amount of fluid is displaced, uh, and each of them is the same, the buoyant force should be the same. The surrounding water does the same job on the same space. And to the best of my ability, I've tried to draw all of those buoyant forces the same length to signify that the surrounding water does a certain job on that space, and the job that it does on that space is it would support water exactly if it were there. So um, the buoyant force you're getting is the weight of fluid you've displaced. Now, that does not mean that the surrounding water is going to support whatever you replace the water with, right? The only thing that Archimedes' principle tells us is that the surrounding water would support the water in that space. It does not guarantee you to support anything you would put in that space. So for instance, if the thing that you place the water with is heavier, so I'll call O for object here, I guess I should clarify, I'm going to put O is object and F is for fluid. If I take that water out and I replace it with something which has more mass and more, therefore more weight, the surrounding water is not obligated to hold it up. It's only obligated to hold up water in that space, not anything you put in that space. So what's going to happen to that? Sink. It's going to sink. Maybe you put something in the space that doesn't weigh as much as the water it replaced. Now you can do that too. The surrounding water doesn't adjust its job. It's only going to exert a certain amount of force into that space, which is exactly the amount that was required to hold up water in that space. This object that we replaced it with does not weigh as much as the water that it replaced. What's going to happen to that? It's going to rise. Or maybe you happen to replace the water with something which weighs exactly as much as it does. What's going to happen to that? Stay put. It's going to stay in place. Because you happen to take advantage of the fact that water exerts a certain force on that space, an upward force, and you put something in there that was weighed exactly as much as the water replaced, so it gets supported exactly. So, let's talk about how is it possible for this, let's go back up to this situation where it sinks, how is it possible to take the same space, take out water, put, out, put in something there, and have it have more mass? What's the only way it could have more mass than the water replaced, even though it's the same volume? It's more dense, exactly. So here, the density of the object exceeds the density of the fluid. It's all about density. If you're more dense than the fluid, then the fluid won't be able to hold you up. What about the density of this one? It's smaller. It's smaller, right? What's the only way it can have less mass than the water, even though it takes up exactly the same amount of space? Well, it's because it's not as dense. What about the density of the last one? Same. Same. Same as water. 
Let me give you an example of something you could put in the water that does not rise or sink. Some other water. You pour water into water, right? It stays wherever you put it. It doesn't sink, it doesn't rise. It'd be weird to see it kind of, you pour water in and it kind of starts poking out from the surface. It doesn't, right? So an example of something which is like this is water itself. Uh, question? For food coloring, you know, I think, does it have the same density as water? Um, it does sink and disperse. Right, so um, you, one of the things that is uh, challenging about that, of course, is that you normally kind of squirt it down and give it a uh, downward velocity. Um, so a better test would be to, um, to take it and put it uh, uh, food coloring without any kind of container, right? Put it right on the surface. Now, if you see it go sink first, then it's more dense. If you see it rise, then it's less dense. But what you normally see with food coloring is that um, it undergoes a process called diffusion, right? So it kind of slowly diffuses. It's not that it all sinks or rises, it slowly kind of just goes out. That's a different process than what we're talking about here. Um, so, there's names for these things, uh, and the names are, I, I like to think of as being uh, according to this axis. Something like this is considered to have negative buoyancy. It sinks. It's like going in the negative direction. Something like this is called having positive buoyancy. And this something like this is called having neutral buoyancy. Another example of something that's neutrally buoyant, um, scuba divers usually um, seek to be neutrally buoyant. Because you don't want, you want to be able to freely swim around without always sinking or all, Always, uh, always rising, right? Then you'd have to constantly fight toward the surface, in this case, to not sink all the way to the bottom, or in this case, continually swim down so that you're not always rising. So you try to achieve neutral buoyancy so you can kind of swim around freely, right? So if you don't swim, you'll just stay put, but if you swim, you can choose to go where you want, right? The way you do that, um, to achieve neutral buoyancy, is you do it by adjusting your, your mass and your volume. So obviously, humans tend to be positively buoyant. You'll float uh, with just minimal effort, right? You can tread water with almost no effort. And if you have an air lung full of air, you'll definitely float, right? You can just float on your back without even moving, right? Um, so scuba divers, to get past the surface, they'll normally have weights, so they have a belt with lead weights on it. But um, they will also have this thing called a VC, which is called a buoyancy compensator. It's basically a vest that you can inflate uh, with air from your tank. So you're not just breathing from your tank, you're also putting air into this vest, and you can change your volume. So you can play around with your mass and volume and adjust it so that your average density is neutrally buoyant. So, um, oftentimes, you'll find scuba divers playing around with their buoyancy compensator uh, to adjust their volume. That way, they don't have it rise or sinking that they're not expecting. So, um, that's the idea of uh, buoyancy. And one of the things that I can do right away is I can do a calculation. These are two forces, and we can do a good old Newton's second law of force balance, right? So let's do F met Y equals M A Y. So in these objects, what we have is we have an upward force, which is from the fluid around it. And we have a downward force, of course, from the object's own weight. And if there is a difference between them, right, if they don't kill each other, there's going to be a net force that results in acceleration acceleration of the object. So here we have to be careful. This is the object which we're talking about. So B 
be careful here to distinguish between object and fluid. So for instance here, we can say that the buoyant force is always equal to the weight of fluid displaced. That's, that's always true. That's Archimedes' principle. The amount of force you get from the fluid around you is exactly enough to support fluid if it were in that space. But of course, these two may not be equal because you may not weigh as much as the fluid you displaced, in which case there will be a net force and you will accelerate. You will rise or sink. Okay? So make sure you understand that the buoyant force is always equal to the weight of the fluid displaced, but it may not always be equal to the object's weight. So let's see what we can do with this. Um, I'm going to make a couple substitutions. The mass of the fluid displaced, well that's density of the fluid times the volume of fluid displaced. And same thing here with the mass of the object. It's going to be the density of the object times the volume. So let's plug all that in and see what we get. where I'm going with this in just a moment. Um, now, let's think about the volumes. This is the volume of water that had to move, and this is the volume of the object itself. How do those two relate for these guys? How does this relate to this? Volume of the fluid that used to be there, volume of the object. That's right. When you're completely submerged, which we are in this case, how much fluid had to get out of the way? Well, the object's worth, right? So I'm going to go ahead and cancel off the volumes. They're all the same. And I'm going to solve for the acceleration. So the acceleration is basically on the side by itself if I just divide out the density of the object. Let me also factor out a g on the uh, other side. Here's what I get. This will be the acceleration of the object. And it's reassuring to see that is going to be some fraction of free fall, right? Something, something times g. Because, of course, the maximum acceleration that you could have here is if something is in free fall because the buoyant force starts to not matter. But you, it would be weird uh, to see something else. I guess you could accelerate more than free fall upward, but uh, let's, um, let's not worry about that. I did want to, did want to point out that this is something times g. And in that ratio, we do see the difference between the object's density and the fluid, right? So if they're the same density, what, what acceleration do we get? Zero. What if the object's density is less? What is that going to give us there? That minus that is going to be a positive number, isn't it? So we expected the acceleration to be positive here, and that's nice, it is. And likewise, if the density's difference is off the other way, we'll get that it sinks. So this formula is kind of the just calculational embodiment of what we were, our ideas from before, which is that it's a competition between the buoyant force and the weight of the object itself. So it's which force wins? If neither one wins and it's a stalemate, there is no acceleration, but if one force is bigger than the other, it may rise or sink, right? Does that make sense? Now, 
there is one thing that this formula is missing, which is kind of a big deal. We've said that as this thing moves, as it rises and sinks, we've said that it has two forces, buoyant force and gravity. But there's a third force, which can be sizable, that is missing. Anyone have any idea what it might be when something moves through water? Pressure. The, the buoyant force is the embodiment of the pressure difference between the top and bottom. Any other ideas? Yeah, so kind of like fluid friction, right? Or we call it drag sometimes. Now, we could say that that was um, fine for moving through the air. We neglect air resistance. But saying that fluid drag is, is, is negligible, that's a stretch. Okay. So for instance, if you look at all the Olympic world records of running a certain distance, they're all faster than swimming the same distance. Why? Obvious reason. You have to move through water, that's much more difficult to move through water, right? Try running even across a shallow pool, and you'll see it's, it's hard. People do that for endurance training because it so, gives so much resistance. So, this formula is of limited usefulness in water itself, okay? So, there is no drag, so it's uh, limited usefulness in a liquid where drag is significant. However, we can remember that our ideas of fluids can encompass gases as well. So this same idea can be used to describe things that are, instead of sinking or rising in water, they can be sinking or rising in air. Let me give you an example. It's on your homework, or will be on your homework. Hot air balloon. Why does a hot air balloon rise. Well, hot air balloon is filled with hot air. Hot air is less dense. It's less dense than the fluid around it, which is the cold air, right? So the reason why a hot air balloon rises is because its density overall, even including all the fabric and the basket and all the people riding in it, its overall density is still lower than the surrounding cold air. That's why it rises. And then we can get away with the same thing we've been getting away in projectile motion, which was neglecting air resistance, or in this case, neglecting uh, you know, um, the equivalent, um, what we've been, I just called it drag, but that would be good, back to good old air resistance, right? So you're going to want this formula right here when you do your hot air balloon problem, which will be on your homework. Um, you should definitely understand the steps to get it. I don't mean this to be a derivation. I want you to understand the steps, and certainly this formula that I have shown you here is not on the equation sheet. So anything that's not on the equation sheet, make sure you know how to get it and where it comes from, because what I might do on an exam is tweak some little step in the, um, along the way to make sure that you really understand and you're not just memorizing equations. Um, are there any questions before I move forward? Okay, so we're moving forward to the next case. Uh, now, what's going to become of this thing that rises? What's it eventually going to do? Go to the surface. And assuming it's not more, less dense than the air, it's not going to keep rising. It's going to come and float, right? So the floating case is the next case we're going to do. Very similarly proceeding, we're going to once again consider the buoyant force, the weight of the object, and make some of the similar substitutions. I want to keep this up for reference so we can compare and contrast how this goes. Let's do the floating case. here that's floating, and we already know that the only way that's going to happen is if the object is less dense than the fluid. So let's write down what happens. Well, obviously this object has weight. If it were not in 
some liquid, it would free fall. But what holds it up is the fact that it's displacing some fluid. And remember where that force ultimately comes from, it's the fact that the bottom of the object is at a larger pressure than the top. So it get, gets pushed up harder than it gets pushed down. So the air pushing down and wanting to get into that space is not pushing as hard as the water that's below wants to get up into that space. That's where the buoyant force comes from. So let's set it up, F mit y equals MAY. What is the acceleration if it's just floating there? Zero. Because it's at rest. What forces are acting on it? The buoyant force and the weight of the object. And in this case, they have to cancel. Remember, they didn't generally have to be equal, right? They weren't equal over here, that's what led to the acceleration of the object. But here, because they, the object isn't accelerating, we can safely conclude that they are equal. So in this case, these two are equal. That's different from our rule for getting the buoyant force which is that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of fluid displaced. So that's always true. So let's compare and contrast, right? The amount of force you get from the fluid is always equal to the amount that would be needed to support fluid. That's always true. That's our committee's principle. We plug it in here, we plug it in here. Before, that force may not have been enough to support the weight, so these two are not equal. Now, they are equal because we know it's staying at rest. It, that's just Newton's first law. If something stays at rest, we know that the different forces that act on it, which have nothing to do with each other generally, and under no obligation generally to be equal, happen to kill each other. Okay? So let's see what we get. I'm going to cancel off the G's. <coughs> And what I get is that these two masses are equal. Uh -huh. The mass of fluid displaced, the mass of the object. It might be instructive to draw these masses so we can have a visual representation. The object looks like this. There's the block. The water that's actually displaced is that. Part of the object is above water and has nothing to do with the displacing fluid. It's only the amount of fluid that's below the water line that had to get pushed out of the way. Those two things have the same mass. But do they have the same volume? No, they don't have the same volume. This is a larger volume, and this is a smaller volume. Now we are not submerged anymore. And so the volume of fluid displaced is not the whole thing. The amount of fluid that had to move out of the way is only some fraction of the object's volume, right? In fact, the volume of fluid displaced is the volume of object that happens to be underwater, right? Not the whole thing. Okay. So we have that these two things do not have the same volume, but they do have the same mass. How is that possible? Density. The different densities. Which one has a larger density? If the masses are equal and this one has a smaller volume, what does that mean about its density? It's larger. density times volume. If the masses are equal but the volumes are not, then it's got to be the density. So according to that, which has a lower density? The object, right? It's much larger, but it's the same mass, so it's got to be less dense. We already knew that. We already knew that the object was less dense. It's nice to see it verified here, of course. And then, 
I'm going to get you another formula, which once again is not on the equation sheet, but you'll find it very useful for the homework, so understand the steps to get it. All I'm going to do with this is I'm going to sort out so that the volumes are on the same side and the densities are on the same side. It looks like this. John, you may not think this is remarkable, but uh, I'm going to show you uh, what you can do with this. Um, it's the ratio of volumes on one side and the ratio of densities on the other. I want to um, replace the volume of fluid displaced with the volume of the object underwater. How much fluid is displaced? However much of the object is underwater, under the water line. So what do I have here? I have on the left hand side, I have the fraction of the object's volume that is submerged. Right? That's what I have. It's the object under, how much volume is underwater over the, as a ratio of the whole. So this tells me that I can actually predict for an object with a, a density a solid object with a certain density, I can predict how much of it will be underwater by taking its ratio with the ratio of the fluid I put it in. That's a pretty nice shortcut. In fact, this ratio gets a, uh, its own name in chemistry. Does anyone know what the ratio of an object to the density of a reference fluid, what that ratio is called? Anyone in chemistry? Anyone? seeing it, but I forgot. Okay, it's called a specific gravity. Does that ring a bell? Kind of. Maybe? Oh, okay, well, it's the thing that normally, it's the specific gravity of the object. It's a weird word for it. I don't know um, why they call it that. It makes it seem like it's going to have the same units as G. It's not. It's actually unitless. It's a ratio. It's a ratio of the object's density to the density of the fluid it's in. Usually the reference fluid is water, although you can. So if you just give someone the specific gravity of something, say, say 1.2, usually that means it's 1.2 times the density of water. Or if you, someone tells the specific gravity is 0.9, that means it's 0.9 of the density of water. If someone wants to do it in terms of another reference fluid besides water, they better tell you that. Hey, this is specific gravity but with respect to oil, not water, or something like that. So this is a very kind of useful statement. You can use it to predict how much is something going to be submerged based on how its density compares to the liquid. So let me just do a couple examples. Um, are there any questions on the left-hand side here before I clear a little space? Okay, so let me give you some examples. Let's say our reference fluid is water. So density of water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cube. And my first density of my object is going to be 250. So I have an object of density 250 kilograms per meter cube. Pretty low density. Okay. What is the ratio of that to the water density? What's 250 over 1,000? One, one fourth. So we get that the specific gravity is one fourth. That means one fourth, or 25%, of that object will be submerged. If we floated such an object, it would float only 25% underwater. It would stick out quite a bit. Only 25% is submerged. 
How could that be? Well, the reason why is if this object is so low density that once it goes, drops down into the water and has only displaced 25% of its own volume, that water already weighs as much as the whole object. Okay? So, this is a very fluffy kind of um, low density object. It only has to displace one quarter of its own volume before the water it displaces already weighs as much as it does. And remember, the surrounding water would be obligated to hold that up. So this water weighs as much as the whole thing. Now, that is for a low density object. I'm not necessarily saying it's a low mass object. This could be a dense object that's a million uh, newtons or something, or, or you know, it could be have a, uh, a million kilograms. Right? It would still float. Because if it's going to be that massive, it also has a gigantic volume if it's going to be this low density, right? And it turns out for that kind of object, no matter how big it is, no matter how much mass it has, once one quarter of it has gone underwater, then it'll be held up. So this is not about mass, it's about density, right? So you ever heard the, if you want to kind of frustrate your friends, you go, which weighs more, a ton of feathers or a ton of bricks? They're both a ton, okay? But one has a far different density, right? So this is a matter of density, okay? Let's do another one. Let's say the density is, uh, I don't know, 750. So what is the ratio there? What's the specific gravity? Three quarters. This is three quarters, or 75%. This is starting to get more dense. This will have to go down 75% of the way down into the water before the water weighs as much as it does. Because remember, every drop of water you displace is forced upward. Because the, uh, the amount of force you get upwards is the weight of fluid displaced. And here you're going to have to di displace 75% of your own volume before the upward force is enough to hold you up. Now these are hypothetical objects, which obviously I gave them nice round densities, so they make nice ratios. Let's do a real one though. Okay, let's do the density object is 917 kilograms per meter cube. That's ice. Okay. So this ratio would be 917 over a thousand. Which would be 0 0.9. 917 or 91.7%. This thing is so dense that it will float with 91.7% of its volume underwater. That's how far it has to go down before it's held up. So let me draw you a picture. Here we have the ocean, we have a ship. Here's an iceberg. There's an expression for this. It's called tip of the iceberg. What does the expression tip of the iceberg mean? There's a lot more that came from. 91.7% is under the water line. So this is where, especially in the days before they had underground imaging, why they want to give a very wide berth around um, icebergs when you're, when you're out in the ocean, or you'll end up like the Titanic, right? It's not that you're going to run into the part that you can see. You can avoid that. This is the stuff you're worried about. So there could be a lot more where that came from, and you can't necessarily tell that you may run aground on the underwater parts of the iceberg because you can't see it. Does that make sense? And we go all the way up to if the density of our object was a thousand, 
how much would be submerged? All of it. All of it. So you pour water into water, it doesn't stick out, right? So it has to go in completely in order for it to be held up by the surrounding water. It's not like there's extra that sticks out from the top. Okay. And that's, of course, the, the this fraction right here, the fraction of the object's volume that is submerged, how can you submerge more than you have, right? So this ratio, the volume of the object under over the total volume, this seems to cap out at 1, right? Does that make sense? Unless you have something which we call a boat. So we can have a boat, which is a super displacer, I like to call it, because a boat allows you to displace far more volume than you even yourself have, right? So if you want, uh, you, if you jump in a lake, you're going to float, but with a large portion of your volume underwater. You're lucky if you can maybe just keep your, your uh, breathing apparatus above the waterline, right? But if you use a boat, you can stay completely dry, because a boat is able to displace all of that water for you, right? So you can have things where you can displace far more volume than you yourself could with your own, own, own volume. So a steel ship, for instance, you might say, how does a steel ship float? A steel is more dense than, than, uh, than water. Well, it's not just a solid block of steel, right? It's steel, but also a bunch of air. And your ability to displace water is tremendous. So, yes, you might weigh quite a bit, but the amount of fluid you've displaced is tremendous, and you can get enough buoyant force to hold you up. So every time you see one of those gigantic cruise ships and you think about how much must that thing weigh, think about how much of that is under the water line. The water that it displaces weighs as much as that cruise ship. That's how much water you have to displace. Tremendous amount. Of course, your ability to displace this fluid assumes that you don't bust a leak, right? If you have a leak and water gets in, well now you're not displacing as much fluid and your buoyant force is going to shrink and you're going to go down, right? If you had a solid object, then putting a hole in it doesn't matter. It's either going to float or sink based on its own density, but here, because it's not just a solid block of steel, you can have that water can get in. And it can cause the buoyant force to significantly drop because now that fluid is no longer pushed out of the way. Um, any questions on that? Okay, so you guys will have um, that uh, um, uh, lab next week. Um, it just occurred to me, I think I might have had that homework due like during one of the labs by accident. I'll have to check on that. I need to fix that if that's the case. Um, so that's buoyancy. And that also marks the end of our topics in fluids, which we call static fluids. So fluids aren't flowing anyway, they're just stationary. We're going to do now two topics in moving fluids. Moving fluids, we'll do something called flow rate, and we'll do something called Bernoulli's principle. And once we've done that, that's the end of the fluids unit entirely and also the end of homework number 11 material because homework 11 is the fluids homework. I think I have a good shot at finishing flow rate today. It's not very difficult. And then we'll do Bernoulli's uh, next time. Um, so let's talk about flow rate. We use the letter Q for it. It's defined as the volume that flows per time. 
Its units are meters cubed per second, which is hopefully exactly how you think it should be defined. It's as we were talking about flow rate for a river, right? It'd be asking how much volume of water passes per time. Maybe you want to talk about the volume flow rate of your faucet. How many meters cubed of water can you get out per second? Best way to do it, take an empty gallon jug, put it under the faucet, take the volume, one gallon, divided by the time that it took to fill it, that's the flow rate of your faucet, right? Obviously, it's adjustable, right? So you might, you might want to talk about it fully open, right? Faucet fully on full blast. Um, there's other flow rates, so I just want to clarify that this is technically volume flow rate. Um, you might talk about mass flow rate, which is mass per time, or other things like that. So this is the only one we'll talk about. So I'll refer to it as flow rate because we don't have anything else to mix it up. What I just mentioned is by far the best way accumulating fluid to do it for a fluid that you're gathering up, right? So if fluid is piling up and it's accumulating in a volume, if you want to know the rate at which it arrived, take the volume it filled divided by the time. Um, there is another formula that you might want to use when the fluid is not stopping and accumulating, but it's actually just flowing past. So you're just trying to take a census of it, even though it comes in and then goes off somewhere else. So for instance, in like a pipe. So you have a pipe with fluid flowing at speed V. And here I'll try to be careful with my uppercase V's for volume and my lowercase V's for speed. Um, so what I'm going to imagine is that in this pipe, I have an imaginary volume that I'm going to imagine filling from the left, but also emptying simultaneously to the right. So the fluid is just kind of being counted as it fills this volume, but it's, of course, continuing right on through. This is a hypothetical volume. I'm not literally trapping it. I'm just counting it. Um, this volume is going to have a cross-sectional area A, and I'm just going to have a width delta x. So if I were to use my formula, volume filled per time, well, the volume is, of course, area times width. Right? Does that bother anybody? So it's like volume is length times width times height. You just combine the length and width into the area. And then I divide it by the time taken. And then this, of course, how fast you fill up the width delta x in a time delta t is the speed of the fluid. So this is an alternative formula for a flowing fluid, like through a pipe. It's very helpful as well. So you take the cross-sectional area of the flow, that's A. Some options you might have here, maybe the cross-sectional area of the flow, maybe it's a circle, so you use pi r squared. Maybe it's a rectangular uh, pipe, if then you'd use length times width. Different options for the cross-sectional area. And then the second is the speed of the fluid. So it's cross-sectional area times speed, not volume. And hopefully you'd be convinced, right, that both of those things should matter. Right, if you have a hose, right, where the water is flowing out faster, you're getting more volume per time, right? So if your fluid flows faster, that means more water per time. Yes. But if I gave you a tiny garden hose that water was flowing out at a certain speed, and then I gave you a gigantic sewer pipe where water was flowing out at the same speed, obviously there's more water coming out of the sewer pipe per time because it's wider. So if the area increases, that also means more water delivered, right? So, um, those are your two formulas that are both have their usefulness. You can combine and match them. If you have, for instance, fluid that's flowing through a pipe, then you use this. If that then later accumulates somewhere into a 
some like a pool, then you can use this. And in fact, I would suggest um, that if you have any kind of uh, situation where water is flowing from one section to another, then what goes in must come out. This is the mathematical embodiment of what goes in must come out. So this is what goes in one end, and this is what goes out the other end. Now the reason why, of course, what goes in must come out is because we learned that water is incompressible, right? So the density is incompressible. So you can't put more water into a space until the same amount comes out the other end, right? It's impossible. If it was packable, you could put more in without getting some coming out, but water isn't packable. So, I'll give you an example. Let's say we have a narrowing hose, like this. Call this section one, call this section two. Water comes in this end, water goes out this end. The cross-sectional areas of these two sections of pipe are widely different. But, we can't have water appearing or disappearing, and we certainly can't have more, some water coming in without the same amount coming out. So, I will say that A1 times B1 is equal to A2 times B2. Because the cross-sectional area decreases, the fluid has to flow out faster. Classic example of this, if you feel lazy and you don't want to walk over there to water the uh, the flowers, put your finger on the end of a garden hose, right? You narrow the cross-sectional area, you make the fluid go faster. So finger on the end of a garden hose is a classic example. Um, let me give you another ex uh, couple, uh, quick example here. Um, now this does not work with traffic. Four lanes going into one lane traffic does not speed up, right? Well, that's because traffic flow is compressible, right? Your distance between cars, there's room for it to be absorbed, right? If you have four lanes on the highway, you should be having a safe falling distance. When everyone slows down, it compresses. Maybe one day everyone decides we're going to make an incompressible traffic flow. So if there's four lanes going at 50 miles an hour, if everyone sees it goes down to one lane, everyone just goes it's 200 miles an hour. Then we can keep the same distance between cars, but obviously not very safe. So instead, something else has to give. Traffic flow compresses. Uh, another example that would apply, you may know that as blood flows from an artery, artery to a capillary, blood slows down. So that seems to be a counterexample, but it's actually proving this because one artery does not flow into one capillary. There are many. And the combined cross-sectional area exceeds the artery that fed it. So that's actually an example of the area increasing and therefore the blood can slow down. Okay. So this is a common thing um, that is important also in uh, biology. So uh, let me knock off there for today and we'll pick up for newlies on Monday.